Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It's my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life. In all seasons, rain, shine, clouds, sun, here we gather. We're glad that you are all here this morning to take this day and this opportunity to gather in community and to share joy, comfort, and sometimes challenges. We are an intentional community gathered around our shared promise to support each other's spiritual journeys. So let us worship together, all gender identities, sexual orientations, politics, race, ethnicities. May we root ourselves in the values of this faith of compassion and courage, transcendence, justice, transformation, and service. And I especially want to welcome anybody who is joining us for the first time or has been a recent visitor. Uh, Thank you for taking a chance in this day and age to join us and to check out another group of people, another body of religious uh, institution to be with us in this community today. And part of our acknowledgement of relationship and community is to recognize uh, where we are grounded. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They were here long ago. They were here to welcome the Europeans as they came down the Illinois River. We recognize and offer our, uh, offer our respect to the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. And now speaking about uh, being together, I want to invite you to put all devices into worship mode, whether that is buzzy or silent for you. I see people moving. I, you know, this is a daily thing. We always have to check, right? It's okay. Um, I want to offer a note, uh, a couple of notes. One in particular that next Sunday, we're going to talk about this Sunday in a minute, but next Sunday, next Sunday is our in-gathering. It is the start of our congregational year. Uh, This is when we will be gathering for our in-gathering water communion, which is a place and a time where we have a particular ritual in Unitarian Universalism of bringing a bit of water from wherever we come from, whether that was near or far, as a physical way to, uh, and bring it together to our common bowl as a physical way to recognize our gathering in, in this moment. Also, uh, we have some excellent plans as well. There is a potluck. Ooh, food. Yes. So that is also a gathering in, if you will. Uh, So please bring dishes to share. There will also be hot dogs and some other snacks already there. And also after the service, a splish splash game, some water fun. So be fair, be warned, you might get a little wet, but there's also going to be wet stuff that's not going to get you wet as well. There are options. And I really want to thank uh, Jesse Lachlan and the Religious Education Committee for leading the way on the uh, potluck and the activities and for getting us organized. Thank you very much, RE Committee. Uh, Also in the world of things, keep in mind, if you drove in today, you might have seen that we have these big red cans all over the place and patches in in the parking lot. This week, the parking lot will be resurfaced in its entirety and restriped everywhere that it's needed on top of that new surface. So the building, after today, the building will be closed until Saturday. The whole parking lot is going to be cordoned off because we really want to try to avoid any tracking in of tar or paint onto the carpet. Terribly practical. So please keep that in mind. If there's anything you need to take with you from the church today, do it today. Now today's service... Uh, is first in the monthly theme of belonging. Uh, And in this case, the belonging is going to be connecting with our larger Unitarian Universalist Association. So for parts of the service, I'm bringing elements of our general assembly. What's our annual meeting uh, that took place in June in Portland, Oregon? Uh, You're also welcome to to join me for a little coffee and conversation for any follow-up conversation or expanding uh, what General Assembly took, I can only give give you the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is this, Um, and there's much more to talk about. So I want to encourage folks, if you want to come and ask me more questions, we'll be gathering in Fellowship Hall after the service. 
our opening hymn, uh, to take a cue from that, our opening hymn is by Unitarian Universalist musician Jim Scott, and it's Gather the Spirit, and it's the one that was offered at uh, General Assembly. We'll be seeing a couple of, seeing with a couple of the videos uh, this morning. It is created by the Singing the Living Tradition Band, led by Francisco Ruiz. And now please rise, embody your spirit, and join me in singing with the General Assembly, Gather the Spirit. Gather the Spirit, harvest the power, our separate fires will kindle one flame. Witness the mystery of His hour, a triumph is mine. Appear all the same. Gather in peace, gather in thanks, gather in sympathy now and then. Gather in hope, compassion, and strength. Gather to celebrate once again. Gather the spirit of heart and mind. Seeds for the sowing are laid in soul, nurtured in love and conscience divine, with body and spirit united once more. Gather in peace, gather in thanks, gather in sympathy now and then. Gather in hope, compassion, and strength. Gather to celebrate once again. Gather the spirit growing in all. Drawn by the moon and fed by the sun. Winter to spring and summer to fall. The chorus of life resounding as one. Gather in peace, gather in faith. Sympathy now and then, gather in hope, compassion, and strength, gather to celebrate once again. Please be seated. The Sunday morning service at our General Assembly was in person and online and watched by congregations across the country uh, on the day of and over the course of the summer. The opening words offered by the worship leaders speak to how it was to be away from each other for so long and how it was to be back, how it is to be back together in all the ways that we gather. So let us hear the opening words. Come now across platforms and practices. To declare with joy our resilience. To proclaim on purpose. We have survived the pandemics of our time. We have survived, we are surviving. We have pivoted and we have planned. And then replanned. And then thrown all plans to the wind. In this circle, we will say without shame, some days we lost our way. And some days we lost our passwords. <sighs> and we have not always been our best selves. We are learning. Not always quickly. To regroup and remember, perfection was never the point. Amen. We are here because we long to try again. To promise with people to be partners. In this long haul work of loving. And becoming. Even while we grieve also the cost. Which is not small and lingers in our hearts. And turns only sometimes into rage. Here, let your body tell the truth. Shake free the stories that live in your skin. Breathe in your beauty. And breathe out 
your burdens. Breathe in our beauty and breathe out our burdens. Be here with it all, with all of us. In the freedom of this new day. The storm is passing over. The sun is breaking through. And this new day, it dawns for us all. Come, let us worship together. At this hour, in small towns, in big cities, in single rooms, and ornate sanctuaries, so many of our sibling Unitarian Universalist congregations are also lighting a flaming chalice. And so as we light this chalice today, let us remember that we are part of a great community of faith. And may the dancing flame inspire us to fill our lives with the Unitarian Universalist ideals of love and justice and truth. And now we have the story from Jesse Lachlan. Good morning. Good morning. <sighs> so this story is taken from Beyond Every Door by Molly Hausch Gordon. Who here knows the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Have you maybe read it a time or two? It's a family favorite for me. Can one of the kids in the room tell me how Lucy Pevensey discovers Narnia? Shout out. In a closet. She opens a door and goes into the closet. Lucy looks for the perfect place to hide and opens the door to a big wardrobe. She goes deeper and deeper. And suddenly, she's in a whole other world. Ooh, we're trying something new. It's not on. Here's, she goes through to a whole other world. A magical world with fawns and witches and talking beavers. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a magical world beyond every door? When Lucy opened the door to Narnia, it didn't, it didn't look like anything special. It was just a boring door to a wardrobe full of clothes and coats. But across this threshold was magic. Lucy already had a foot in Narnia before she quite realized what was happening. <clears throat> Many of the thresholds in our lives are like this. We don't know that we're crossing into another world until we're already halfway there. The door of a church takes us down a pathway Not so good with the clicker. Flip, oh. oh, up. Okay. I should have practiced. The door of a church might look familiar to you. A door of a doctor's office suddenly opens into life with a hard diagnosis. A restaurant door opens into a first date and echoes into the relationships of a long time. A beloved person's door closes behind you and sends you into the world heartbroken. 
the door to a library or a gym or a dance studio introduces you to a life's passion you might not have otherwise discovered. We cross these thresholds every day of our lives for good or for ill, in joy, in sorrow, and in bittersweet truth. Truly, even our own front doors is a great threshold, no matter how familiar the worlds within and without it might be. Given our lives reality of constant change, every day we open that same old door again, only to step out into a world that is new since the day before. In this way, there is a new world behind every door, awaiting our discovery, if we will only think of it as so. So now I invite the children to come with me through a door back to the Arida area. The work of the church is one of welcome. We prepare to meet our friends, our neighbors, fellow travelers, whether we know them or not, in every moment and at any stage of life. Simply coming through the door, virtually or in person, we prepare, our, we prepare ourselves to receive everything that shows up, the entirety of our lives. In taking a collection during worship, uh, this is part of our act of readiness. This is part of our act of being hospitable, of being hosts. It is part of our effort to be ready, to greet, to serve, and to encounter. So as part of our service in the world, we also send part of our abundance out. Uh, today marks the return of our practice of share the plate. Half of the undesignated offering uh, that we receive will go to uh, our named recipient, whoever that might be in a particular time. And in this moment, uh, the Social Impact Committee chose to start with the New Mexico Coalition for Reproductive Choice. They are working with partners in Texas uh, including First Unitarian Church in Dallas, uh, that church that was kind of at the heart of the Roe v. Wade, uh, supporting the Roe v. Wade uh, uh, legislation um, case. Uh, and these contributions will go to cover the costs of transportation and abortion services for people from Texas uh, who have to travel to New Mexico in order to get them. So the Texas Coalition for Reproductive Choice tries to aid up to 20 people every weekend. Uh, and the cost is about $1,000 per person. So keep that in mind. Uh, as we're creating this, we'll have this collection be the, the share the plate recipient for uh, at least a few weeks until the Social Impact Committee has a chance to kind of put their schedule together of additional recipients. Uh, for this moment, if you are off making an offering in the collection toward a pledge, your regular giving, uh, please indicate that in the memo line of the check or written on the offering envelope. Uh, and again, half the designated offer, undesignated offering, excuse me, will go to uh, the church and half will go to Mexico Coalition for Reproductive Choice. 
I want to thank everybody for your generous giving of any kind in this time and in this age. Thank you and thank you. And now the ushers will pass the plates. Uh, this is after the ushers pass the plates, this will be the time for lighting the candles uh, of care. You're welcome to come forward and light a candle and as a way of expressing what is in your mind and on your heart. So let the ushers come forward. light from these candles illumines that which is in us and around us. This is the moment for the sharing of joys and sorrows in the congregation. We first begin with congratulations to Reverend Dave Clements, who's formerly the interim minister. Thank you. Uh, he celebrates the completion and publication of his new book entitled, When the Elephant Laughed detailing his experiences while serving in, as an interim minister in South Africa. You can find his book on Amazon, I think. Let's see. We also offer a note of another note of joy 
uh, that for T Tim Harold and Bill Ordaz, they are celebrating their 25th anniversary. And they're in New York City. I guess that's okay. They can go to have a nice trip. Yes. So congratulations to Bill and Tim for 25 years. We also uh, offer a note of celebration to, uh, with Katie Jones. Uh, she is celebrating her new role as a adjunct uh, social work professor at Bradley. Congratulations, Katie, for the new job. We offer a couple of notes about health and wishes for recovery. Uh, first to Jim Johnson, who's a member of the congregation. Um, to Jim as he faces some health challenges. And we also offer uh, wishes for health to BJ Lindsay's close friend, Christine, who recently had her sixth, that's sixth, that is a six, breast cancer surgery and is beginning a series of chemo and radiation treatments. We certainly hope that Christine does well with these treatments. And now let's turn to sympathy. We offer our care and concern to Yvonne Harmison and her family. They mourn the loss of Yvonne's stepson, Brett Cohn. Uh, he died at age 40. Uh, he was from Washington, Illinois. He died on August 27th, and he leaves behind his wife, Brittany, and four young children, Alex, Isabella, Riley, and Sawyer. We also offer a note of sympathy to the family of Patricia Franks and the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Venice, Florida. They announced Patricia's passing on August 29th. Patricia was from Green Valley, Illinois. Uh, we understand that she was possibly a teacher in the Peoria school system before moving to Venice and joining the congregation there. Uh, we understand that she was part of this congregation before going to Florida. We offer our condolences to Patricia's family and to the congregation. And now, let us take one more moment in quiet. Within this circle of care, we hold all that is shared. Within this circle of care, we know much remains unspoken. So let us offer to ourselves and to each other one more moment of quiet to be present, to be present to all that we need to do in this moment, to all that lives in us in the whole fullness of our lives. Let us share one more moment of quiet. Amen and Namaste. I offer a final prayer for today in honor of Labor Day from Amanda Udis Kessler. On Labor Day, we honor the work, physical and mental, paid and unpaid, joyous and heartbreaking. We give thanks for the work's gifts, suffer its difficulties, and strive to make labor just and joyous for all. Our work can build our society, provide for our material means, and offer our life meaning. And thus we labor in gratitude. Our work also can damage our society and planet, fail to sustain our needs and be meaningless. So we join together in, to create work that supports the well-being of all. Our work can help heal the world, help us understand who we are and keep us safe. And so we labor in joy. 
Our work can harm the world, demean us, expose us to danger. But we join together to create work that is safe and humane. Our work can fill our days with accomplishments and our lives with stories. And so we labor in love. Our work can dissatisfy and alienate us. We may not be able to find enough work or any work. But may we join together to create work that blesses us, all people, and all the planet on this Labor Day and all Labor Days to come. May our work, all work, serve humanity and all living things. So may it be. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go, beloved. Where you go, I will go. And your people are my people. Your people are mine. Your people are my people. Your divine, my divine. Picture, if you will, thousands of people in person plus thousands online rising in body or spirit and singing together. Gather the spirit, harvest the power. Our separate fires will kindle one flame. People there are of all ages, sitting, standing, rolling, chasing after toddlers. I used to be that person meeting and merging into one voice. So the General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association is the annual business meeting of our association. And so collectively, delegates and volunteers and staff take up the major questions of our tradition, of our faith in any one moment, and take care of what needs to be addressed according to bylaws and policy. So think of this as a supersized congregational meeting, you know, that lasts for like about a week. No, no, it's a whole lot more fun. I'm going to tell you right now. Yeah. Plus, this is not just the meeting. It's not just the business. It's presentations and workshops and worship, and it's celebrating and honoring life passages in our religious professionals and so much more. It's going out for coffee or lunch or just randomly encountering people you may not have seen for years or people that you are getting to meet for the first time. It is a chance to connect with people from across the country and, in fact, all around the world. So this year's General Assembly was particularly poignant and compelling as this was the first General Assembly that was in person since 2019. The last two have been pretty much entirely online. But it's also, was also this first effort to be truly multi-platform um, as well. And so there was a rich online community, a rich online structure for people to participate in all of the business, as well as a lot of the workshops and social gatherings and questions and so on. And all of the plenary and business was accessible as well. And many folks, myself included, uh, did a mix of in-person and online. So even though, you know, I'm, I'm there in Portland, Oregon, uh, in the hotel nearby, I'm going to say it was awfully nice to be able to join plenary from the comfort of my room at times, as opposed to always being in the convention center. The access, if you can imagine like thousands of people getting together to do all this for, for a number of days at a time, it is kind of exhausting. And so this access made it easier to participate at one's own speed. That was lovely. 
So what I want to offer in this moment is kind of a part one and part two of this experience. And as I said before, it was simply, it's truly the tip of the iceberg. I highly recommend going online and looking at the GA materials that are available uh, for everybody at the UUA site. So the first section of the message will be mostly about what happened, what did we do? And the second part will be about some of the meaning of this. Oh, did I, am I hitting this? There we go. Yes, we want this back. Thank you. No, that's fine. So first, I want to let you all know that I brought the church banner along to Portland, Oregon. And if you haven't, didn't know what the church banner looks like, it's the one in the middle. It is the beautiful work that represents our stained glass. Now, the banner, our banner's immediate neighbors uh, were the Unitarian Universalist uh, Ministry for, in Great Lakes that serves Navy boot camp recruits uh, from the Georgia mountains in Dahlonega, Georgia, the UU Congregation in Greater Lansing, Michigan, and the UU Fellowship in Missoula, Montana, and on the far end there, the Holston Valley UU Church in Gray, Tennessee. And Holston Valley and their banner, so you don't have to try to squint to read it, because I had to, uh, includes their vision of sharing love, pursuing justice, and seeking wonder. Part of what is so glorious about just the banners, frankly, is how much it expresses diversity in our ministry and in how we express ourselves in Unitarian Universalism. Because these come from not just congregations, but uh, additional bodies and advocacy and so on that just kind of to represent um, the wide range of effort that it could be for ministry for earth, it could be ministry for animals, all, and many, many more. There's a banner that's just the youth caucus, actually, those teenagers who meet at General Assembly. There's one of those as well. Now, a conference, of course, wouldn't be a conference without a name badge. I'm just saying, could have that one. And there's a near infinite number. Did I do this right? Yes. There's a near infinite number of possible ribbons, and some youth create these long trains. They collect them all, and they kind of have to, like, have to wrap the ribbon around their neck as they walk through things. I'm telling you. Mine was a little more specific this year. From the congregation and being part of this congregation and... Uh, the green dot to say, yes, I'm willing to be around people, and also my, my delegate number, the big ribbon that says, yes, I'm a delegate, so I can vote on the business and be in the plenary. Beloved Conversations, some of you know this program uh, from workshops in person, but Beloved Conversations is a program that helps people work through white supremacy culture and helps us move through being a more anti-racist and more multicultural in our personal and our professional lives. And the 21st century UU are for those who are actively welcoming the diversity and inclusion in our faith tradition. And I am a member of our Liberal Religious Educators Professional Association, Lareda. Okay. So now we can quiet the... We, don't, we can move away from the slide. Go back to the big screen. That I don't know how to ask for. Okay, we're still learning. See, we're always learning. Speaking of, let me offer the thing, the truly new thing I tried this, this time that I'd never encountered before. Has anybody heard of this thing called silent disco? <gasps> oh, oh, I'm seeing people actually know what silent disco is. That's so excellent. All right. Yes, we did this out in public. No shame. So, so it's shared music. It's a dance. It's shared music, but all the participants are wearing headphones. So it looks like, if you come upon this without knowing what's going on, if it looks like random other people wearing headphones and dancing, and there's no sound. Like, no sound. So, but... But when you're wearing the headphones and you hear the music and you're around this crowd of people, you can... Everybody is moving. And when you're in it, you're in it. And, you know, that might have been happening out in the public square of the convention center in full sight of whoever was passing by. Hi. 
It's great for one's, you know, dignity. Yep. Just kind of, mm -hmm. yep. Just moving along here. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, even if you weren't wearing the headphones, if you're simply silently watching this silent disco, that the watching of the people was a pretty great joy as well. I highly recommend finding places for more joy, and this was one of them. So I want to offer a couple of the, of just a few of the highlights of the business. So one, uh, one of the most significant is that the delegates endorsed the UUA board's plan to do a comprehensive revision of the bylaws, like the whole bylaws, uh, partially in an effort to ease the, the structures that were created way back in 1961 uh, that were created to kind of control what was going on and give people not a whole lot of power to make some decisions. Uh, and they want a chance to kind of look at how we have learned and grown in our trust as an institution in the past, you know, 50 years and do uh, 70 years and do something more with that. 60 years, excuse me. There were three actions of immediate witness. Now, this is a method by which um, the UUA body, the delegate body, can respond to contemporary concerns in a very short amount of time. So they called actions of immediate witness. Um, and the first one, the first one I would say probably wouldn't surprise, is we do not consent, rejecting the legal challenges to abortion. Among that information, uh, we get a note from Sister Song, who's the Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective, to say, we unequivocally support every person's right to maintain bodily autonomy, to have children, to not have children, and to parent children in safe and sustainable communities. That's the essence of reproductive justice. And so we as Unitarian Universalists, we're asking ourselves to educate, advocate, build networks for access, which is something that we are doing, can and are doing here in Illinois, and, uh, and do so much more. And I will offer as a note the uh, new stole that I am debuting today, which is about women's, for women's equality, this stole in particular. We are reminded, you know, the decision from the Supreme Court of the United States came down officially on 624, like, and so the, pro the demonstration that we were part of was on that date uh, in Oregon. We were reminded by some of our religious leaders that courts won't save us and that we need to organize and connect locally. That we are all born with twin gifts of agency and conscience and our liberation is bound up together. And so we are called to do this work. The second action of immediate witness was for anti-racism and reparations via restorative justice so that we would engage principles of restorative justice and be truthful about the fullness of American history and fully understand and reject white supremacy. We are asked to align our faith and values and address and engage with restorative justice through connecting with representatives of the most effective communities, marginalized communities, and take action to, to go forth in all levels of political and educational engagement. So we might do study groups in our congregations. We might be advocates for political candidates who are black, indigenous, and people of color. We'd speak out against mischaracterizations of history and so much more. So bodily autonomy, racial justice, reparations, and the third is stop the privatization of Medicare because our U.S. health insurance is so deeply broken and unavailable to so many people, we need a system that serves the public. Pretty simple, right? Stop the privatization of Medicare and make sure it really serves those who need. Now, as always, social justice 
is part of our general assembly, social witness, an active thing of social witness. Um, we'd work with local groups to support whatever their effort is. How can we add our voice to theirs to boost? Uh, for example, when General Assembly was in Phoenix in 2012, uh, folks contacted local organizers, said, how can we best serve uh, the concerns around um, treatment of undocumented immigrants uh, in Maricopa County? And so we prepared spiritually and physically and rode buses to the detention centers uh, for the undocumented immigrants in Maricopa County and made a witness there. Some of us who had children in strollers didn't get on the bus, but were there to participate and support and be in solidarity as well. Now this time, this year, solidarity uh, was with youth who are fighting a highway expansion in central Portland that would further isolate people and take access away from the city for those who were homeless, uh, but it wouldn't actually address the traffic problems it was um, intended to do. But also, as I mentioned, but also because the, uh, because the, the, of the Supreme Court's decision, we also had an, joined in a public demonstration that had formed spontaneously locally uh, to, do, to be demonstrating against the overturning of federal protection of abortion access. Now, there we go. So this is one shot of the thousands of people that gathered in downtown uh, Portland. And some of the signage included uh, in the first photo here, abortion access for all genders. I think it's a really important part of the conversation we need to be refreshing is that abortion access is for all kinds of people, not just women, right? Uh, let's see. I caught one of the signs uh, that caught my attention, which says, I dream that one day a woman will have as many rights as a gun. I dream that one day a woman will have as many rights as a gun. In case we're wondering how important this is, right? And how intersectional these issues are. I got a shot of some of the colleagues that I was marching with at that moment. They're wearing Side Would Love UU ye Yellow t-shirts um, that represent our justice work. And the sign, Reproductive Justice is Sacred. And there were a lot of people at this gathering. And also, oh, excuse me. And also abortion, another sign was abortion is healthcare. I want to pause for a moment and recognize that there's a lot going on. There's been major decisions in our faith. There's been major decisions that we're sorting out in our society. And that how important it is, how precious it was to be able to show up with other people and respond to the moment. So I want to invite us to kind of sing into that moment, sing in that spirit of recognition that what we do together, when we gather together in all the ways that we can, that we can go from information to meaning and feel like we're making, we're adding our voice to it. So would you please rise, embody your spirit, and join me in singing hymn number 95, There Is More Love.
So there is some of the information and some of the experience, and here's more about what we're doing to go further. The bylaws, the decision to do bylaws revision is not necessarily an obviously like sexy thing. Like, ooh, baby, bylaws, yeah, sign me up. I mean, some of us are like, ooh, pit a pat bylaws. I mean, you know, let's respect those too. Mm -hmm. But here's the piece that I really want to make sure that we think about and, and contemplate. Because the biggest conversation may actually be about one particular article which is known as Article 2. And this is where, this is where in our tradition, we hold the statement of seven principles and six sources. The things that we say, we hold true and promote and support, uh, beginning with the inherent worth and dignity of every person, for example. So I'll offer, if you want to, if you have a gray hymnal near you, they're even in the gray hymnal in the very front that these seven sources talk about, we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, do covenant to affirm and promote. I mean, it's in the hymnal, right? So we talk about the inherent worth of every person, justice, equity, and compassion, and human relations, and so much more. They were voted into being. It was a bylaws process. They were voted into being in 1984 and 1985. So we have the principles and the sources, and they acknowledge the wealth of wisdom and tradition that informs us from direct experience and science and nature and humanist teachings and Jewish and Christian teachings, world religions, and then later were added earth-centered traditions. So we were open to, when you look at a bylaws revision, it means actually opening that box as well and saying, how do we want, how do we want to articulate what we say to the world? These aren't creeds. They aren't a test of faith. We don't have to have to learn them word by word and say we agree with everything about them. But we've been working with these for getting on towards 40 years. These were the kind of the these principles and the sources, they were the, state, the best articulation that I was searching for when I was a teenager and wanted to, talk about, uh, wanted to talk about my church with my friends. And lo and behold, this poster with these seven principles and the six sources shows up in my church. I'm like, oh, thank goodness I have a way to do this. I mean, so these have been in working and application for a long time. And... And, as Reverend Bill Sinkford, former UUA president, says, answers that served us yesterday must be tested against the needs of a new day. So we have a chance to say, what do we want to say now? These have been great. And we've also learned and practiced along the way, what do we want to say now? And so that's what's going to happen in the next couple of years, is that we'll have kind of look at the seven principles and six sources, and at the other end, I will give you fair warning, we may not have them at the other end of this process. It will be something different. It will be something new. So that's one of the big news pieces. And I really want us to be in the conversation about what is it that we want to say as a faith and as a tradition and as a people in this century going forward. So that was one of the pieces of learning and we work, work as a whole denomination. And the other one I want to touch on is a conversation that we had with Dr. Ibram Kendi, a lecturer at Boston University and also author of How to Be an Anti-Racist and Stamped from the Beginning. This was during one of the lectures of the time, the known as the Ware Lecture, where we have people from outside our tradition, thank you, outside our tradition um, speak to us. Um, people in the past have included Mary Oliver, uh, Holly Near, and further in the past was Dr. King. 
So this year was Ibram Kendi. And he and Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, our association president, sat down for a conversation. And here's what he was talking to us about. He was defining terms, because we were asking, how can we do the work? A largely white benefiting denomination. What is the work that's before us? So he was defining terms, racist, non-racist, anti-racist, and making a point of saying that these are our descriptions. But someone saying racist is a description, not an identity. You're not, I think one of the great fears that there's a reactivity to being called racist. And we don't always know what to do with that because there's been a burden placed on it to say it's something about you that's wrong inside. That's not, that's not, that's not where that's supposed to go. It's a description of what's happened, not something inside you that's bad, for example. You're not a bad person because you do something that looks racist or is racist. And he was talking about, you know, segregation, black people are inferior due to their nature. That would be segregation. So you isolate people because of that. Assimilation, and he was making this point here, assimilation is when you have the conversation that says, oh, we're all really one race. We're all the same. We're all human, which is true. And what happens is that erases the history and difficulty and the distinctions between people that are also real and affecting our lives on a daily basis. And if you minimize the diversity of our racial experiences, that ends up defaulting to whiteness is better to whiteness is uh, the assumption. And that further erases the racial and cultural diversity. An anti-racist, someone who is working in that way, is saying nobody is inferior, not out of nature or nurture. And so we try to focus on, in our work, in, in anti-racism and anti-oppression, focusing on words and deeds not condemning the people. Because, right, inherent worth and dignity, right? It's about what we do and how do we change what we're doing. And for Unitarian Universalists, there's complexity in our history. There's richness of being uh, abolitionists against slavery, for example. We also have people who were part and parcel and complicit with the whole enslavement of others. One of the questions from the question box sermon a couple weeks ago was whether this congregation will continue to address racism now that Black Lives Matter is not so much in the news. In case you were wondering, here's one of the answers. Yes. Because there are ways that we'll be engaging with this conversation further. The common read for the UUA this year is called Mistakes and Miracles. It's by Nancy Palmer Jones and Karen Lynn. And it's a white minister. Uh, and a lay person of color explore different congregations' experiences with trying to be more multicultural by trying to live the beloved community. Um, and it's about as messy and mixed up as any of these things can, and also joyous as well. So we'll be getting into that reading in the course of things. But even regardless of whether we're with a particular book, a particular class, or in one sermon, we get to practice in all of our time and all of our effort what it is to be good hosts, what it is to welcome the other and not presume that we know somebody's experience. All of this, the work that we're doing with welcoming, with being prepared to have our new year begin, talking about belonging this month, all of that is interwoven with work for justice and equity and compassion. The democratic process as well, because as that is practice in religious community, it is awkward and time consuming and not always in agreement. In fact, often it is not in agreement, but the work itself is the practice, reveals what is essential and where we need to go individually and collectively. 
So as the congregation that we are keep, create together, that we keep creating together, that we keep moving forward. So that is the work from our, uh, some of the, the work from our general assembly. And let us not mistake that in this moment, we may gather on a Sunday and a Sunday and a Sunday and not really know what our particular individual impact may be in all of these great questions. But we gather together and do a little bit of the work at a time. Simply gathering is a powerful statement by itself because we say we think these values are important and we are willing to keep working and transforming our own selves for the sake of a better future, uh, maybe even a better today. The gathering is itself a joy. It is a balm when other forces of the world would restrict our lives, would say no, the gathering, that our autonomy and rights and our lives are not worth just that. But we can say yes. What I want to close with is the recap video from our General Assembly that invites us onward. You'll see elements of some of the things that I talked about, um, and it closes with an invitation to go to General Assembly in Pittsburgh, which is next year and invites us onward into not just next year, but what is possible that we can create together. So if we can see that video, please. to be able to come together in all the ways that we can. There is such a joy in the deep work of creating community, of nurturing our spirits, and preparing the way for the younger generations and the next generations. This is the work that we do, whether we do it in a small group, in our congregations, or on the national scale. This is the work that we do together. Will you join in singing with me Come and go with me as we venture forth into this new work. And this video is also from uh, one of our General Assembly uh, videos, but it is, if you want to sing along in the hymnal, it is number 1018 uh, in the Teal hymnal as well.
you need to come to GA. You go for the singing. So, we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I'm going to close with the practice of gratitude from my colleagues, Reverend Gretchen Haley and Sean Neil Barron, who had offered the beginning, the opening, Brother David Stendhal Rast reminds us that gratefulness is not only a matter of saying thank you, it is an orientation to life or an orientation to trust and to joy. Not about forcing a feeling, but noticing, but noticing. He says there is a wave of gratefulness because people are becoming aware of how important this is, this gratefulness, and how this can change the world. It can change our world immensely in important ways because if you're grateful, you're not fearful. And if you're not fearful, you're not violent. And if you're grateful, you act out of a sense of enough and not a sense of scarcity. And you are willing to share. If you are grateful, you are enjoying all the differences between people and you are respectful to everybody. And that changes the power pyramid under which we live. So let us go forth from this moment in gratitude for the people around us, for the community of faith that we are a part of, for being encouraged in our growth and discovery, and for being called to add, to add abundantly to the well-being of the world. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>